Good morning, church. Good morning. So good to see all of you. We're going to go ahead and start uh, service this morning with a couple songs as we focus on the Lord. So would you stand with us as we do that today? Amen. Come on, let's sing together. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy taste of his goodness and find what you're looking for for god so loved the world for god so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever the power of hell the power Forever defeated, now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved, God so loved the world. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms for god so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever the power of hell forever defeated now I'm walking in freedom for God so love, God so love the world. We sing praise God, praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Let's sing it together. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love, His amazing love. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us whoever believes in him we live forever and the power of hell forever defeated now it is well i'm walking in freedom for god so loved god so loved the world the joy of the Lord is my strength. Come on, let's declare it. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Do you believe it this morning? Come on, let's sing it together. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. And though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. And in the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. And when the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. Come on, let's sing it together. 
The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When I cannot see you with my eyes, let faith arise to you. And when I cannot feel your hand in mine, let faith arise to you. God of mercy and love, I will praise you, Lord. Oh, you shine with glory, Lord of light, I feel alive with you. And in your presence now I come alive, I am alive with you. There is strength when I say, I will praise you, Lord. Come on, church. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When sorrow comes my way, you are the shield around me. Always you remain my courage in the fight. I hear you call my name. Jesus, I am coming, walking on the waves, reaching for your life. Come on, let's put our hands together this morning. The joy of the Lord is my strength. There you go. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Come on, church, let's give it up for the Lord this morning. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. Good to see all of you today. Uh, we have a few uh, awesome things that we'd like to share with you. So I was not here last week. For those of you that don't know me, my name is JD. I'm the youth director here at Heritage. And uh, I had the privilege this past weekend of taking up 40 people to Heartland Christian Camp. And uh, can I tell you from the get-go, spoiler alert, God did incredible things. And I was just floored. It, yeah, we can do it. Let's put our hands together. Jim said I have 30 minutes, so I'll try as hard as I can to fit it in that. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, from, from weeks beforehand, God was already moving in, in ways that, that we don't have time for today. But one of the things that I would like to mention, actually, before I do that, let's get the students that are going to share this morning. So uh, let's get Sarah and Lacey, you guys are going to share. And then Jacob Blanton's also going to going to share a little bit as well. But as I was, as I was preparing for uh, this camp, I, going up to camp, it had felt like I was, I had already returned from camp. So if you've ever been to a youth camp before, you know what it's like. You're on the way back home. You just want to sleep for three days and eat McDonald's. Like, you just, you just, you want to relax. And I, I was so exhausted going up to camp. And I believe God led me to this place. So that way, as I was up there, I could know without a shadow of a doubt that everything that had happened was empowered by God and done by God. And I mean, I'm telling you, testimonies for days. One of those things that I'd like to share with you uh, was the message that we were planning on preparing that week was uh, we were talking about doing masks and unmasking ourselves, right? Play on the, the thing. We were talking about, you know, what kind of masks are we living behind? And so myself and a couple leaders were dialoguing, you know, what, what can we go with that? Where can we, what, what can we talk about? And uh, Wednesday, well, I guess it was Thursday morning at 3 a.m. after I had prepared the songs, the slides, PowerPoints, notes, sermons, small group questions, solo questions. I mean, I worked so hard. Thursday morning, and I mean, testify if this has ever happened to you. Thursday morning at 3 a.m., the day before we leave for camp, God decides to wake me up. And I'm sitting there in my, in my bed, and I'm like, you know, God, what are you, what are you, are you speaking to me? Do you have something important that you'd like to share? And this never really happens to me. Um, and so I was kind of startled at first, but then I just felt like the Lord was sharing some things with me, uh, that I couldn't ignore. And so I woke up on, uh, that Thursday 
and I changed everything. <laughs> I threw it all out, everything, me message, uh, questions, the whole bit, and I said, you know, I need to be obedient to this because obviously God is wanting to do something, and I need to get out of the way. And so I did. I changed everything. I worked really hard, and uh, we did camp, fast-forwarding through that. I mean, the songs connected really well with the kids. The message connected really well with the kids. We ended up doing uh, Luke chapter 15. We we're talking about uh, the, the lost sheep and the parable of the prodigal son and, and those, that moment where Jesus is talking to his audience. And um, it was just an incredible night. You're going to hear some more from, from these ladies in a second. Uh, but on the last day, as we're getting ready to come home, uh, I wake up in the morning and I'm talking to one of the cafeteria guys and he asked me what we talked about. I said, Luke 15. He prayed for me. He said, that's awesome. Lunch comes around and we're ready to go home. And uh, he says, hey, I found one of your stickers. And I said, we didn't make any stickers. What are you talking about? He says, hey, we found one of, one of your stickers. You know, you said you talked about Luke chapter 15. We found one of these laying around. He handed it to me. And on the sticker, it said, Winter Camp 2021, uh, come home. And so at that moment, what I, what I didn't share with you earlier was that there was another camp up there with, or there was another church up there with us. And we weren't allowed to associate with them whatsoever because of COVID. And so what we realized in that moment as he handed me that sticker that said, Winter Camp 2021, uh, come home, was that the other church that was there at that camp as well, that we did not talk to whatsoever, was talking about the exact same thing that we were that entire camp. Come on, y'all. Isn't that, isn't that insane? And so it's like, although we were divided in the sense that we couldn't speak to each other, the Spirit of God just unified us all in a way that weekend. That was nothing that I could have planned or prepared for, right? And so it, it, God moved in incredible ways. I had, I had asked these ladies to share something funny along with spiritual as well. So one of the funny moments for me, um, we had a, a counselor go up that had never been a counselor. We didn't have him come up to be a leader or anything. He was a parent of a student, but we were just so uh, aching for help help at this camp, I, you know, I asked him if he could come and share, and he was just incredible. He had, I gave him the junior high boys, and uh, he didn't like me at first for that, but I gave him all the junior high boys, and he was in the cabin with them. I walk in one morning, or at, at night, one night, and uh, I'm like very, I'm very like, put your stuff away, wash your feet, don't bring this in the cabin. You know, I've done this enough to where it's like, I have rules. <laughs> He wasn't there yet. So I walked in the cabin. There's this red light flickering from somewhere, and there's a tree in the trash can, and kids are, like, hanging from the ceiling. And this guy is, I feel, it looked like a crime scene. This guy is looking at me, and he's just like, help me. But all that to say, I mean, it was, it was funny, but it was just so good. I mean, he was incredible for these kids, and, and God did incredible things this weekend. So um, I'm going to invite uh, Lacey up. Lacey is one of my students. She was the one that got, one of the ones that got baptized this summer, and she's going to share a little bit about her experience at camp this weekend. Do we have a... Let's go. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. I definitely wouldn't have remembered that had I not seen the mask. Thank you, Jim. Okay, let's just make sure we wipe this down. Try to do the best that I can. Thank you. Um, good morning. I'm Lacey. So this past weekend, we went up to Heartland, like JD said, and um, before we even went up, I, I've never been to camp, so it was my first time, and I had no idea what to expect because I've always heard stories of how insane camp is, and I just didn't know it until I experienced it. So all three days were like absolutely incredible, but Saturday night in particular was insane and life-changing. Um, so it was night, we were doing night chapel, and before we started, um, one of the students went up and did like a message and it was super funny and so I was just like okay it's gonna be like more of a fun night you know and then we started worship and instantly like within the first verse of the song like this overpowering feeling just came over me and I got so emotional and I wasn't the only one I thought I was the only one crying but by the end of the song I turned around and like almost everyone in that room was um, crying and just feeling the same feeling that I was feeling, which was crazy. Um, and so we went through the message and JD did like an incredible job of it, um, picking songs to go with his message. And I've heard that message before from him multiple times. And don't get me wrong, they're all like awesome, but this one just spoke in a different way. And it's like unexplainable. I don't know how to explain it, but uh, it just all hit me and it was awesome. I spent the rest of the night like crying because I didn't know how to feel. It was just overwhelming, this 
power. Everyone in that room probably has the same feeling as I did. Um, God was with us that night. He was in that room and he was, you just felt his presence through everything that was happening and it was awesome. Um, and yeah, that was my spiritual awakening in a way. <laughs> um, and so he also wanted me to share something funny that happened. And so uh, after that night, such an emotional and life-changing night, I thought we were going to go in the cabins, you know, have um, like talk about it and have like a the rest of the night leading into like a spiritual, just that's not what happened. So we go into the cabin. We were all getting ready for bed. People were showering, washing their face, brushing their teeth, whatever. And one of the girls comes out from the bathroom and was like, it smells really bad in there. And I haven't even used it yet. <laughs> like, no. And so we were all like, what's wrong? Like no one used the bathroom. Why is it not working? And so uh, turn, it turns out one of the other cabins knocked on our door. I was like, is your bathroom messed up too? So the entire four cabins that our church, the girls of our church were staying at, um, the sewer system got messed up and there was like a clog or a leak in the system. So we moved into the chapel and this was like 1130, almost midnight, I think. And we we're in there for a couple, like an hour or so. And then the maintenance guy came in and said, hey, it's not getting fixed anytime soon. You guys are going to have to move cabins. So at like midnight, maybe 12.30, 1 a.m., we were moving cabins from over here. And we had to go all the way to like the farthest cabins. This was like 1 a.m. And I don't think I got to sleep until like 3.30 that night. And then the next morning, we had to wake up so early for breakfast. I don't think I've ever been that exhausted in my life. But um, honestly, I wouldn't change it because it just from the spiritual night that everyone in that room had to how it ended, it just all worked and it was awesome. And yeah, that was camp for me. And yeah. Thank you, Lacey. So Jamie was actually in charge of the high school girls. So if you see her, say thank you. <laughs> she had to deal with all that. It was crazy. Okay, Sarah. Okay, so I wish I could wing it like Lacey did, but I'm more of a shy person, so I wrote, wrote mine down. But good morning, everyone, and happy Sunday. I'm Sarah. So I'm supposed to talk about my experience about camp last weekend, and I get really nervous easily, but here we go anyways. Okay, so this is my first year at Heritage, and that was my first time going to camp. And let me just say it was life changing because I did not know what to expect at all. And I did not expect everything that had happened to have happened. But it was a really great experience to share with my friends and the new people that I got to meet. And it, being there really brought me closer to them and God. I really felt like it changed me in a way that I couldn't be more thankful for. I really got to connect with God a lot more while I was there. And I really felt his presence and his love the whole time, and that like helped a lot. And I'm like somebody who worries about like so many things like all the time, but like when I was there, like I just really felt like God was there, letting me know that I was supposed to go on that trip for a reason. And I felt like like I like that was just meant for me to happen. And like Lacey was saying that one night we had went into the chapel and we were playing games and all. You, like she thought it was gonna be a fun night. I did too, I thought it was gonna be like, oh yep, this is gonna be a really good night. But when we were there, we like, and we started worship, like the minute the lights went off and JD started playing music, like everybody just started singing. Like you just know you felt all of that overwhelming love and all that joy from God. Like you just know God was there telling everybody like he's here with us. And it just felt really got, like really good to know that God was there telling me and reminding me of his reckless love that he got me. And it really changed me and my insight on many things. And I can't wait for summer camp and for everything that trip has to bring. And um, during the during worship, um, when we we're all singing that song, um, it did overwhelm me too. And like it like, but I'm not someone who like lets that out so easily. So after chapel, I was trying to like go talk to someone about it because like you know I just really wanted to let it all out. But um, I did get overwhelmed about something, and then so like 
um, I got shy, so I ran away, and then I went to go cry by myself with my friends, and they helped me a lot because they were there telling me, like, it's okay, like, you know, that's just God letting you know that he has you, and it was just a really good thing, and I'm just super glad that I got to go, and, okay, and we're supposed to talk about a funny story, and I had a hard time choosing what to choose, but something that did fun, something funny that did happen was Okay, on the way there, we got assigned a person to go, like, with, and I got Roger here, and I got some amazing girls that I got to go with, and we were the Tarzan van. That was our name. We are the Tarzan van. And um, when we were there, we didn't, I didn't know what to expect. I thought it was just, you know, we were going to talk about ourselves, but no, when we were in there, I got a geography um, lesson. I learned about his Vietnam um, experience. It was good. And then we also learned um, a little dance. I'm not going to do it because I'm the only one here, but we learned the, um, a new song, and then we performed it when we got there for everybody and at the end before we left. <laughs> but that was my experience. Good. All right. Um, yeah, last weekend, I didn't even know if I was going to go. Um, and then JD kind of forced me to go, so I was like held against my will to, to have to go. But um, no, I'm glad I went. Um, I've been to so many different camps and been, been a part of so many different camps and styles and stuff. And it was just, this last weekend was something different because uh, we weren't set to like an agenda. That wasn't like, okay, at this time we're doing this, at this time we're doing this, at this time we're doing this. It was just kind of like a, here's what we're going to do and let's hope we make the time that we said we were going to do, um, which didn't happen most of the time. <laughs> Except for the meals because the camp set up the meals. We had, to, we had to be there for those, otherwise we'd miss it. Um, but it was just kind of cool to see all the students just kind of going with the flow, just kind of hanging out, you know, ready for whatever, you know, happened because we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but I think what the, the girls were saying was just like spot on. I mean, the chapels were just amazing. That one chapel that Lacey was talking about, um, just standing in the back and watching everybody worship, all these junior hires and high school kids just worshiping God and, and being up in the mountains is just like this great thing to, uh, to, to witness. It was just so much fun to watch these kids um, grow closer to God through the worship, through JD's messages, through the discussions that we had afterwards, because um, even we, I mean, we didn't know what to expect with some of those boys that we had, um, some of those junior hires. We were just like, uh-oh, like, what's going to happen? Um, but our discussion time was really so great. Um, all of them just participated so well and answered, you know, questions and even asked questions that were just so great. Um, we did one-on-one -on -one times, and there were tears shed during that, too, because it was just so cool to see these kids break down and kind of open themselves up to us and kind of... Um, just let us pour ourselves into them and pour God into them. And um, the, like I said, this weekend was, was not like a camp I've ever experienced. And I've experienced so many different camps. But uh, it was so, so cool to see um, God working in the lives of these kids up at Heartland. Heartland is such a special place. So, uh, yeah, it was a great weekend. So, Thank you. Are we getting Pat up here? I think we have some announcements for us. So... Pat Garcia, if you can make your way to the front. She's got a few things that she'd like to share with us today. Act four. <laughs> I think this is act four. I'm not really sure. Is this act four? All right. So it's really good to see you guys again. Good morning, church family. So <laughs> let's see. Here's one really big announcement. Jen Gonzalez had a birthday Friday, so let's all wish her a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Jen. <laughs> I got to give these up. I just can't seem to do it. I need the, what's that patch? Anyway, so we have a gift for first-time guests. If you go back to the information booth in the social hall after the service, 
Pastor Roger will give that to you. And then also next week, we're having a baptism uh, Sunday morning after the worship service in the courtyard. See Pastor Jim if you want to get involved in baptism, right? So, um, and also we're hosting a, a blood drive on Wednesday, March 10th from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the Mount Vernon parking lot. Sign up online to participate. Flyers are in the information booth. All right, here's my last one. Children uh, up through sixth grade can be dismissed with Miss Jen Gonzalez to go to Heritage Kids. Kids, don't do what I do, okay? <laughs> okay, good to see you guys. I've been in church for a long time. <laughs> I've never had to follow something like that up. So let's see what happens. Let's go stand to our feet, and uh, we're going to continue our service this morning. Father, we, we love you, and we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to gather together. Uh, being, being in 2020 has just uh, shown me, at least, how important it is that we come together and are sharing our faith with one another, catching up with one another, being the church, encouraging each other, admonishing one another, and uh, it's all in the spirit of you, Jesus. And so as we're here and we sing these songs, God, would you remind us uh, of your great love for us, of your uh, power and how we can rest in your authority and your sovereignty. As we sing of how good you are, Lord, would you remind us of how we have all that we need in you, God, there's nothing more for you to, to, to give us that can outdo your son, Jesus. And so we have all that we need, God. Would you help us to remember these things as we declare your goodness? Love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I want to sing it again, I love. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing in the goodness of God. All my life, you have been faithful. Of the goodness of God, I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. I will sing of 
of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all we praise his name this morning. Do oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Then on the third at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trampled death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. And oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore for endless days. We will sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. He shall return when robes of white, the blazing sun shall pierce the night. And I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. How many of you are thankful and excited for that moment? Come on, let's sing it again. He shall. He shall return with expectation in robes of white, the blazing sun shall pierce the night and i will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on 
Jesus' face. And oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing Your praise, O Lord, O Lord our God. O Lord, O Lord our God. Come on, church, is He the Lord, our God, this morning and forevermore? Amen. You may be seated. Thanks for the sharing earlier today in the service. That was great to hear what God had done at camp. And as a pastor, uh, I can really appreciate what J.D. does you know, in having to reshape everything at the last minute. I can't uh, uh, imagine that and the challenge. But that, that's just evidence that, uh, uh, that it's the work of God. You know, When God says, get rid of all your plans, let me do my agenda, then you, you know it's of the Lord, okay? It's great to see. Um, you know, every, every Friday and Saturday, the pastors get four pages of notes of prayer concerns in the church body. We don't share a lot of those, but as, you know, as the secretaries are making calls to everybody just to find out what's going on, uh, we as a staff pray through those needs, and there are people dealing with deaths of loved one during this time, during the COVID time, they're struggling. Uh, there's others who have relatives who are going through uh, you know, chemotherapy and they're battling cancer and, and uh, illnesses and concerns about others. And so uh, there's just a, a lot of concerns. Uh, and in the midst of, of everything, with COVID lasting for nearly a year and people uh, wondering if schools are going to reopen and, and all these things, other schools, not our school, um, but uh, which has been a great testimony and and, oh, there was something on, on Facebook this last week where a parent testified how good it has been to have their child in our school getting in-person instruction and, and how different uh, that has uh, made in, in that child's life, which is great to see. But, and I was thinking about everything that's going on. You read the headlines, you can really get discouraged and depressed and, and the political scene and uh, you know, COVID and all uh, and then I thought of, of Romans 8, nothing ever separates us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Not, not death, not disease, not trial, not hardship, not sickness. Nothing any of us go through will ever separate us from his love. And uh, we just need to remember that as, as we go forward and, and uh, jump into another year with, with COVID and hopefully seeing that decline and, and get better. Uh, join me just in a word of prayer. Father, we, we thank you for this opportunity to gather, to focus on you, to give you our love and adoration. God, we thank you for the reports from youth last weekend up at Heartland, the lives that were changed through worship, through messages, through small group discussions. Thank you that you prepared the way, that you touched hearts, and you were already preparing hearts to receive your truth, your word, in the lives of those young people. As they said, it was a life-changing experience. God, we thank you for the power of your word, the power of your spirit in our lives. And now, as we open up your word, we pray that we would live with the same expectancy of, of you speaking to us today and allowing uh, you to, to transform our lives, our minds, our hearts. Give us the confidence we need to face the challenges and problems we deal with every week. We lift up families that are going through real trials and challenges. Thank you for the, your promise. Nothing ever separates us from your love. And now we commit this time to you. Open our hearts and minds as we look into your word. In Christ's name, amen. Some of you may remember this illustration. The church is like the airline pilot who announced to his passengers during a flight, and he said, folks, I've got good news 
And I've got bad news. The good news is we have a strong tailwind and we are making excellent time. The bad news is our compass is broken. We have no idea where we're going. <laughs> and sadly, that describes too many churches who are busy with activities. They're going forward, but they don't always know why. Many of them have forgotten their purpose. So that's why our message today is entitled, Begin with the End in Mind. The end refers to our goal, our purpose, our mission. We're continuing our, our series on Mennonites by reviewing the, the Mennonite Brethren Confession of Faith, which is really our core beliefs, the spiritual foundation we cling to. Okay? Um, everybody have a, a confession? Hold it up if you haven't. Okay? Uh, is there anybody that doesn't have a, We have ushers ready to pass uh, copies out to you. Um, okay. Jim and, and others, uh, keep your hand up. People are coming forward with copies for you. And you can bring this each week. Uh, we're about halfway through. Uh, and even if you for, forgot it at home, you can, can uh, ask for one. Uh, a couple ladies up here in front. You have some more copies? They're in the usher's room. There's no more. It's so popular. I ordered 50 a couple weeks ago. Okay, here's one coming you can share. Okay. So we are looking at, at Article 7 today, Mission of the Church, and that's why it talks about our end. See, for us, uh, our purpose, our end, is Jesus' last command, the Great Commission in Matthew 28. And if you're familiar with the, the Great Commission, you're uh, probably, you probably think of the last two verses of Matthew 28. Turn there with me. To Matthew 28, we'll have the verses up on the screen. But when people think of the Great Commission, they think of this. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Yeah, the Great Commission starts with evangelism with the command to make disciples. And I, I've made this statement before. If, if we're honest about evangelism, evangelism makes Christians and non-Christians uncomfortable. Too many people uh, equate evangelism, uh, they think of a sales pitch or they think of a drive-by shooting, neither of which are, are positive in our life, you know. And in, in our church culture, uh, we ought, when we think of evangelism, we think uh, of, that we need to learn a certain method or technique to share our faith. And yet, when we think of it as a method or a technique, we miss the main point of the Great Commission. Um, we need to look at, at this command in its context. If you have your Bibles, look with me at Matthew 28. The context of Matthew 28 is uh, uh, Matthew 28 de describes... Uh, the resurrection of Jesus and, and what happened after uh, he was dead, uh, after he was killed and after he was buried. What happens is that in Matthew 28, women are coming to the tomb to anoint his body with spices, which is what they did in that day. Um, and so they're coming to the tomb. Uh, as they get closer to the tomb, a series of, of bizarre events begin to occur. An earthquake comes and it's shaking the ground. An angel comes down and rolls the stone aside that's covering his tomb. The Roman guards see all that. They're frightened to death and they run away. The women show up at the tomb and the angel is, is inside the tomb. And the angel looks at these women and says, listen, Jesus isn't here. He's been resurrected. He's risen from the dead. Go back and tell his disciples that Jesus wants to meet them up in Galilee at a certain location. And so the, the women hear that message, and, and so they run back, they tell the disciples, look with me at Matthew 28, verse 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. That's always intrigued me. They had just seen Jesus. He's come back from the dead. They worship him. But there's some in the crowd. These men have been with Jesus for three years. 
and some are doubting. Why are they doubting? What well, I just began wondering and thinking about that. Yeah, the other the you know the, the trauma of the Jesus uh, death and, and crucifixion, it's his suffering, you know, it may have been too traumatic for him. Maybe some of them were still in shock. I don't know. I'm sure there were some who, uh, they met up with Jesus in Galilee, and some wondered, is it really him? Because a few days ago, he, he was killed, and we buried him, you know. We know that there were other people, they had different expectations of Jesus. Some really expected him to set up a brand new political kingdom, get rid of the Romans and reinstitute Jewish rule in the nation. And that hadn't occurred. So maybe Jesus didn't really fulfill his mission. So some worshiped, some doubted. And Jesus' first comments to them in the Great Commission are the most important comments, and these are the comments we usually skip over and ignore. Look with me at verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Where did Jesus get this authority? Well, we know that he was crucified on the cross for our sins. He was buried in a tomb. He rose from the dead. He rose victorious over death, victorious over sin, just as he had predicted, just as he had told his disciples. And by that, he showed them and the world that he was indeed God. No other religion can make this claim. Universalism is so popular in our society, the, the idea that, that all religions and, and all spiritual beliefs will, will get you to God. And if that's so, then, then Christ's death was unnecessary. The truth is, Christianity is exclusive in its teaching about the only way to God and who it is that gets into heaven. Look with me at a couple of verses on the screen, John 14, 6. Jesus talking to his disciples, and he said, Jesus answered, said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, that's narrow-minded thinking. People say, oh, isn't it? oh you're, that's narrow-minded. Yes, it is. Okay? How many other leaders of religion have died and risen from the dead? Only one. I'll listen to him. And then in, in Acts 4, verse 12, Peter is, is talking with the Sanhedrin, who are the, is the Jewish Supreme Court in Israel, defending and explaining why he's been preaching about Jesus in the temple when, when he was told not to do that. And said in verse 12, Salvation is found in no one else, referring to Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. By his death and resurrection, Jesus showed that he is the one supreme God. All authority in heaven and on earth are at his disposal. Let me give you one example during his ministry. Before the disciples really knew a lot about his ministry and who he even was, Jesus sent them out to do ministry. And he said, I want you to go and heal the sick. I want you to raise the dead. I want you to preach the kingdom of God. You know? I mean, what if I told you that's what we're going to do this afternoon? I'm going to pray for you. I want you to go uh, heal the sick, raise the dead, preach the kingdom of God. Okay? Then you know how the disciples felt. But Jesus looked at the disciples and he said, I'm giving you my authority to do all of these things. Now go. And they went out in pairs. And what happened? They went out in his authority and believed that it was his authority given through them. And miracles occurred. They saw the sick raised. You know, sick healed and dead raised. And, and they came back and they said, man, it's true. We saw Satan fall from heaven. You know, they were so excited. They were able to cast out spirits. They saw miracles. Wasn't, they knew it wasn't their ability in the same way that, that the youth went to Heartland and J.D. knew it wasn't his ability and all of his preparations. God had different plans. The disciples went out in his authority and God did miraculous things through them. Based on his authority today, Jesus tells us to go out and tell others how they can know God through Jesus Christ. 
It's not our effort or our charisma or our personality. It's his. It's his message based on his authority. Okay? And people respond to that. See, when we forget that, that Christ has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, and we think that evangelism or we think that, that sharing our faith, it means we rely on a, a method or a technique, you know, that we have to do in our own strength. Um, we've, we've missed the point. Um, listen to this overview of, of the church in history. We put it up on screen. One author and writer has said, in the beginning, the church was a fellowship of men and women centering on the living Christ. Then the church moved to Greece, where it became a philosophy. Then it moved to Rome, where it became an institution. Next, it moved to Europe, where it became a culture. And finally, it moved to America, where it became an enterprise. You know, it's sort of a, a stinging criticism of the church. Uh, look at your confession. Turn with me. If you, open it, if you open it up, it automatically opens it up to the very middle, and then turn back one page, because they don't have page numbers. But we're looking at article. Look at, we're looking at Article 7 today, the mission of the church. It's short. Let me just read the entire thing. It says, We believe the good news of God's salvation in Jesus Christ is for all people. Christ commands the church to make disciples of all nations by calling people to repent and by baptizing and teaching them to obey Jesus. Jesus teaches that disciples are to love God and neighbor by telling the good news and by doing acts of love and compassion. That's a summary of Great Commission that we read and the last sentence, the Great Commandment. Then the last paragraph, the Holy Spirit empowers every Christian to witness to God's salvation. The church as a body witnesses to God's reign in the world. By its life as a redeemed and separated community, the church reveals God's saving purposes to the world. That is our purpose. That is our end that we need to keep in mind. It's interesting to me as I've studied evangelism, uh, the word evangelism originally meant, thousands of years ago, meant to receive a reward for sharing good news. The, that picture comes out of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when Israel would go into battle, if they were victorious, then somebody, a messenger, would be sent back to Jerusalem to share the news that Israel has been victorious in battle, and they would receive a reward. They're receiving a reward for sharing good news. Over time, evangelism, uh, the word simply referred to, to sharing good news, See, evangelism comes from the word evangel. The word evangel literally means good news. And when you look at the four Gospels, if you study all four, and, and David's small group is studying that topic today, uh, if you look at the four Gospels, the first three are very similar. Those were written about fairly about the same time during the middle of the first century. Well, decades later, the one disciple who was closest to Jesus, who was called the beloved disciple. That was John. Most of the other disciples had died. Near the end of the first century, John was still alive. He had been sent to the island of Patmos, but, but uh, so he's secluded. He's still alive. He decides he wants to write a gospel, the life and ministry of, of Jesus, but he's got a different purpose in mind. He's got a, a different angle that he wants to take in, in putting his gospel together. Um, different reason. Uh, turn with me to John 20 in the, in the end of chapter 20. John reveals the purpose of his gospel. Let's show those verses. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written, referring to what he's written in his gospel. He says, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Okay. So Jesus wrote his gospel, his version of Jesus' life, for the purpose of evangelism. He wanted people who, who received his gospel to read it and receive Jesus, believe Jesus was, was the Son of God, the Messiah, and receive the life that, that he offered, the eternal life. And so, because that was John's specific purpose, which makes him different than the other three, which are referred to as, as synoptic gospels, meaning they're all, they're all very similar. 
But John was unique. John wanted his, he wanted the gospel to share the gospel and have people come to belief. And when I, when I realized that about John's gospel, that, that really became my favorite gospel. And I, I began looking at John's gospel from a different perspective. And specifically, you know, John included stories that are only found in John for the reason that people would come to faith in Jesus. And so I said, okay, let me see how Jesus shared his faith, how he shared the gospel. And I began realizing, it, it became very clear after a while, Jesus always started with, with a person's need. Whatever a person perceived their greatest need to be, that's where he started. Jesus did not start with his agenda when he met people. He didn't have a, a plan already to share with them, four laws or five principles or, or three acts of grace. He, he, when he met people, he waited to find out their greatest need. And then he worked to meet that need. And by meeting that need, that was good news for a person. That need was not always spiritual. Sometimes when he met people, their greatest need was physical. Sometimes it was emotional. But whatever their need was, that's where he started. He met the need, and then they were open to receive spiritual truth. Let me give you examples real quick, a real quick overview of, overview of, of some incidents in the Gospel of John. If you look at John 3, there's a religious leader named Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, you know, wanting, and he's coming with, with spiritual questions and a need. And Jesus looks at him and says, that's great, but, you know, unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. And, and Nicodemus is just startled. He can't believe it. But it shook him up so much that he began exploring what that really meant. Nicodemus ends up becoming a, follow, a secret follower of Jesus. Towards the end of the Gospel of John, he ends up helping Joseph bury uh, Jesus and, and defends him among other religious leaders. So Nicodemus came with, with a spiritual need. In the very next chapter in John 4, Jesus meets a, a Samaritan woman who's come to the well to draw water. Her greatest need wasn't water. Her greatest need was, was acceptance because everyone in her village rejected her because she had such a poor track record of staying married and immorality. And, and so Jesus addressed that need. And that touched her so much, she went back and be, became the evangelist to invite the whole village to come listen to Jesus. And Jesus ended up staying there a couple more days. In chapter 5 of John, Jesus meets a lame man and, and heals him. In chapter 8, Pharisees and religious leaders bring a, a woman who's caught in adultery. And they want to stone her and ask questions. And Jesus prevents her from being killed, prevents her from being stoned. And then looks at her and says, go and sin no more. In the next chapter, chapter 9, Jesus meets a blind man, heals the blind man. And then the blind man, in explaining what happened to religious leaders, he ends up lecturing religious leaders who are spiritually blind. They get mad at him and kick him out. So what does that mean for us? And that's Jesus' example of sharing good news. I think what this means for us, and it, it's been my approach that I've used for years, is that when we meet people, and we learn what their greatest need is, whether that's spiritual, physical, or emotional, social, whatever their need is. If we can show them how Jesus meets that need, that's good news. And if we can show them how Jesus can meet their most important need in their life and then introduce them to spiritual truth that addresses their spiritual need, then they want, often want to come to faith. See, when we think of evangelism as as a way to meet people's needs, then people will know that we love them. They'll also know that God is relevant in their life. Unfortunately, there, there's a prevailing myth in churches that, that often hinders evangelism. I've, I've talked with a lot of believers. Many of them will tell me things like, well, when I become stronger spiritually, then, then sharing my faith is just going to become uh, more natural and more easy for me to do. Many of us think that, and I want to tell you, that is not true. If you grow stronger spiritually, you become more spiritually mature, you will become more aware of, of your weaknesses in your life. 
If you become more spiritual, you become more aware of, of sin in your life that, that dishonors God. And the devil will use that as a way to create doubt and fear. You know? And he'll speak to you and just say, oh, you can't share your faith. Look at, look at the areas where you stumbled and where you've made mistakes. Even the most mature believers will struggle with that. Rick Warren corrects this myth with some of these comments. Let's put these up on the screen. Rick Warren says, the church's main mission, mission, main business, I should read my notes, it's easier. The local church's main business is not maintenance, but mission. Not nurturing Christians, but discipling non-Christians. Indeed, the local church is not called to renew the existing church before reaching out, because the church's renewal begins as it obeys God by reaching out. And nothing renews the existing church like a steady stream of new believers. And I've seen this. Sometimes we think, well, if I become more spiritual, then I'll go share my faith. What I've discovered is as I go, as I, I don't wait for it. If I just go out and focus on sharing my faith, I'm dependent on God a whole lot more. And I'm growing more in my faith as I'm reaching out to others and sharing my faith. So renewal comes as we walk in obedience, as we share our faith as doors open up around us. Let me share my experience with you. I've shared some of this before. I became a Christian in high school when I was 16, my junior year. The following summer, I read the entire New Testament. In fact, I read it in three weeks. That changed my life. Those, you know, after, after a month of getting through the entire New Testament, that probably changed my life more, more than almost anything. And that's the power of, of God's Word. Well, that was the summer before my senior year. I came back to, to high school, and, and it was through the ministry of Campus Life, Youth for Christ, that, that helped lead me to, to the Lord as friends shared their faith with me. And so after high school, I volunteered with Youth for Christ. And uh, I ended up being involved in their junior high ministry. I did that for three years. And I, was, I, I hadn't even been a Christian less than uh, a year and a half. And they said, oh, Jim, we're going to make you a director of one of the junior high clubs that doesn't have any clubs. So you and your friends are going to go start a church from, or are going to start a, a club from scratch. And I was young and dumb and didn't know any better. And I said, oh, okay, sounds good. And, and so the four of us went. We didn't know hardly what we were doing. We're all, we're, we're all 18 years old. You know? and we, so we started junior high club. We started from scratch. And in three years, we had over 100 junior high students coming every week. You know? And we saw a lot, of, a lot of junior high kids come to Christ. We saw a lot of lives change. Um, it was just amazing. One of those junior high boys... You know, they, you wonder what's going to happen with these. One of them is now on local TV news show in Fresno. So he's a local personality. I won't tell you his name. Um, but everybody in, in Fresno knows him. He was part of my club. He saw I was on Facebook last year and noticed I was a pastor. And so he contacted me, sent a message, and he wanted to tell me what was happening in his spiritual life. Said he, a few years ago he had come to faith in Christ. He had gotten baptized he saw I was a pastor. He just, he just wanted me to know about that, you know? And that, that was 40 years ago, yeah, 45 years ago. Um, and out of, that, out of that youth ministry of three years, I really felt a call to pursue full-time ministry, you know, if you can get a call to ministry by working with junior high students, you know it's of God, okay? But I, I love doing that. I love those junior high kids. I love sharing faith and, and you know, helping them and deal with that and, and deal with, you know, them becoming teenagers. And, and it was just a, a great experience. And here, I want to tell you something. Many of the practical ministry skills that I use today in in teaching and evangelism and leadership, believe this or not, I learned doing junior high ministry. When I was 18 or 19, 18, 19, 20 years old, that's when I learned a lot of ministry skills that I still do today. And that was during college. Well, after college, yeah, I went away to seminary, clear over on the East Coast. And I, I took Greek and, and Hebrew, 
studied theology and church history, you know, dug into the New Testament and Old Testament. And so I gained a lot of knowledge. That's what they teach you in seminary. I didn't learn a lot of practical ministry skills. Um, and, uh, and here's the point. You know, if you want to do ministry, the best way to do it is to jump in and be willing to do it, you know, hopefully with, with a little bit of supervision. That was my experience. I'm 18 years old, new Christian, and they say, go start this club. Okay, you know, and, and we stumbled and, and, you know, fought, and, and eventually God blessed our efforts, and, and we knew it was the hand of God doing it through us. The best way to learn how to share your faith is not by reading another book and not by taking another class, which is what or watching another film, watch another video. Uh, best way to learn to share your faith is go out and do it. Learn what works, what doesn't work, what doesn't work comes back, and, and you try a different approach. Learn by your mistakes and, and what works, and, and God will bless you. you know? Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And he can, commands us to go make disciples by sharing our faith. Commands us to, to baptize people. And we're going to do that next Sunday, right after the worship service. He commands us to teach others to obey him. And Paul describes the, the spiritual growth that God desires to see in, his, in the church in Ephesians 4. I know, you know, we looked at, a, the, at the middle of Ephesians 4 last week. We closed by, by reading that. I want to go back to that same passage and read it with my, make a few more comments today. Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13 says this, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service. Why? So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The church is built up as Christians are equipped for ministry. The Greek word for equipped literally refers to mending of, of fishing nets that have holes in them. I mean, you're not going to catch a lot of fish if you throw out a net and it has holes in it. You know, and fish are caught and then they swim through the holes, you know. So equipped is, is mending a fishing net. The word equipped also refers to, to setting a broken bone so that it can heal properly. Both of those images, the fishing net and the setting the broken bone, result in, in somebody being productive and healthy and growing. That's what it means to be equipped for ministry. And as Christians engage in service, that's how the church is built up. And so we... We grow as we are giving out, giving to others. We become strong as we are involved in, in serving others. Verse 13 says, as the church is built up until we all reach unity in faith and in knowledge of Jesus and become mature. And what is interesting to me, it says, until we all reach several rules, results, tells me that spiritual growth is a process. Okay, It is a lifelong process of, of growing spiritually. None of us will ever arrive completely on this side of glory. But, and here's the thing. God isn't looking for perfection. He's looking for progress. The Christian life means taking two steps forward and often falling one step back. We all grow, we all stumble, but we still want to go forward. Even the Apostle Paul talks about until we all reach. And so we're all reaching. We're all growing. We're all striving. Then Paul describes the, the results of, of growth, what happens when the church uh, is built up and becomes mature. Uh, verse 14 through 16. Then we will no longer be infant, infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. 
From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So the results of the church being equipped for ministry and growing is that we learn to discern uh, truth by avoiding deception. We become mature, which means to become Christ-like. And lastly, verse 16, the church grows as each part does its work. Every one of us is important for the growth and health of the church body. So lastly, our mission as the body of Christ is two things. One is to, to share the good news of Jesus and to show the good news of Jesus by how we live and how by our lifestyle. We share the good news, we show the good news. The church exists to help you do both of those in your life. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that, first of all, all authority has been given to you in heaven and on earth, and you give us that authority. You give that authority to your children to do exactly what you did while you were here on earth. Thank you for that great promise in, in John 14 where Jesus tells his disciples that they will do exactly what he has done and even greater things because Jesus returns to the Father to send the Spirit out. Lord, I pray that we would be open to your authority, your power, that you would work through us, not only sharing our faith but growing um, until we all reach that unity in, in faith and knowledge. Pray that you would use us and as your instruments, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand for a final song before a final benediction. Shall we turn in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face and oh praise the name of the Lord our God oh praise his name forevermore for endless days we will sing your praise O Lord, O Lord our God O Lord, O Lord our God Amen. Remember in a few moments ago I said spiritual growth is a lifelong process. You will continue to grow until the day we die and step into God's presence. The Apostle Paul, who was probably the most spiritual man, who wrote most of the New Testament, admitted in, in a letter to the church in Philippi, he said, I press on toward the goal to, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This week, God calls all of us to press on and to press on toward him. James says, as we draw close to God, he draws close to us. That's his promise to us. May we press on, and as some say, press in to his presence and his power. May that be your experience. God bless you. You're dismissed. There's coffee and water in the social hall. Okay.